Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Hi. Thanks, Abby and Olga. Uh, so as you see on the slide, all the names of all of our participants in the, in the four presentations that were uh, pre-recorded -pre and posted for you all in Vimeo. Uh, here with us today, in addition to myself, um, we have representing the Archive of Tomorrow, uh, Ailey McGlone and, and Leontine Talboon. And they'll be speaking, uh, or I think Le Leontine will be speaking about uh, that presentation for a few minutes. And then followed by um, the representatives from CARTA, the Collaborative Ar Ar Archive, which is today represented by Madeline Carruthers and Sumitra Duncan. And I believe, I think Madeline is going to be speaking on, on their behalf, but we'll see. And then the third uh, speaker today will be the Collaborative Collection Development Challenges and Opportunities, which is from the, the Ivy Plus Libraries Confederation, uh, represented by Miranda Seiler. And then lastly, I will be speaking about the IPC Collaborative Collections. And then we'll, uh, after a brief, you know, four or five minute descriptions of each of these papers, uh, we will be turning it over to questions. We'll start by with some prepared questions, and then we'll we'll shift to uh, questions from the audience. So I will now invite um, our representative to speak about the archive of tomorrow. Uh, that's uh, Leontine. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, or evening, or morning, uh, wherever you are. So um, I'm Leontine, um, and I'm here with my colleague Ailey. Uh, from the Archive of Tomorrow project. So the Archive of Tomorrow project is um, a project that's exploring and preserving online health publishing. Um, the project is led by the National Library of Scotland um, and is funded by the Wellcome Trust, but there are quite a few partners in this project. So I myself am based at the Cambridge University Libraries, um, and we also have um, partners at the Bodleian Library in Oxford and the uh, and Edinburgh University Library. And also the British Library is one of our supporting partners. Um, so the aim of this project is to explore and preserve health publishing as I, online health publishing, as I just said. Um, and we're, the aim is to collect 10,000 URLs around this um, topic. Um, but we're also hoping to use this collection as a test bed for uh, to explore the generation of metadata, uh, rights clearance, but also try and do some data analysis on this collection. Um, and also a very important thing, we're trying to create an active community around this type of um, health web archives um, in like that more broader research space. Um, so one of the main things that we talk about in our presentation is the collecting framework. So we've been working on this um, for a few months now and it's a very fluid document and it's a great like example of one of how we're working collaboratively on this project um, so everyone can contribute we have multiple meetings about it um, and it's been actually really great because it means that we've been able to establish a number of topics that we want to explore quite early on in the project but also um, highlight some ethical and more moral considerations in publishing this type of material because as you can imagine um, a lot of it is coming from official sources such as say the NHS or other uh, government bodies but there's also a lot of misinformation present in this uh, collection. Um, so yeah collaborative side is great because we get like a lot of room to discuss stuff and uh, these types of issues and also um, on top of that, not only with like the project partners, we're also doing a bunch of workshops. Um, we've had our first workshop last month um, and we invited a bunch of like people, um, stakeholders, but also researchers or users of the collection um, and gave us like the community to, to directly communicate with these people. Um, but in the presentation, we also highlight that there's a number of challenges around this like collaborative uh, approach. Um, so it's a large number of institutions that are related to it and everyone has like slightly different regulations and procedures in place. So um, it can be quite challenging at times because we have different um, computer systems that we use. So sharing documents can be a pain. 
um, but also due to hiring processes, we've not all started at the same time. So sometimes it's difficult because you have to find a balance between um, wanting to do stuff like to get started on the project, but you also don't want to exclude colleagues that may be starting at a later point. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of highlights the benefits and drawbacks of the collaborative side of the project and an introduction to the uh, project. I don't know if um, you want to add anything, Ailey, but I think, I think that uh, covers most of it. Great, no, fine by me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Leontin, Madeline, do you want to speak next? Can everyone see and hear me okay? No. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Madeline, and I'm a program officer on the community programs team at the Internet Archive. I'm here along with Sumitra Duncan to introduce the Collaborative Art Archive, or CARTA. Our project utilizes the resources and professional expertise from a collaborative entity of arts and cultural heritage institutions in order to build scalable collections of archived web based content, um, all related to art history and contemporary art practice. The Internet Archive and the New York Art Resources Consortium, or NIARC, um, officially launched CARTA in August last year with grant funding from IMLS and NEH. And since August, we have primarily worked on formalizing the collaborative member group and growing the CARTA collections. Um, but the grants also include funding to build an access portal and data sets and other methods for promoting use that we'll be working on later this year. We have eight active collection topics within CARTA, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and list them. It includes art criticism, art fairs and events, art galleries, art history and scholarship, artist websites, arts education, arts organizations, and auction houses. Um, and as we all know, um, recent global events and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic have made significant impacts in all of these areas and arts communities around the world. Um, so CARTA is an especially timely project for this collaborative group of subject experts to identify at-risk and vulnerable web content in order to make a more comprehensive record of 21st century art history before these online resources disappear off the web. For this project, the technical work and web crawling is handled by the Internet Archive, but all of our members contribute to the collections with regular website nominations and participation in collaborative activities that enhance and inform the collections. Since we started collecting in November, we've received over 430 website nominations from our participating organizations and our archivist account, which maintains all of our collections, has collected over 3.5 terabytes of data and that continues to grow on a weekly basis. Since the official launch, we have grown to over 34 participating organizations and our membership ranges from smaller nonprofit art libraries to regional museums and academic institutions and much larger national arts organizations. This membership also has a geographic range throughout the US and Canada, but we are interested in expanding this membership internationally to enrich our collaborative collections. And we will be continuing to accept new members on a rolling basis from arts and cultural heritage institutions throughout the world. Um, for anyone who's interested, um, member participation in CARTA um, includes developing the collections through website nominations and metadata generation, promoting CARTA through networks and engaging with researchers and end users, and providing regular feedback for the initiative and contributing to sustainability work. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved or have any further questions after this session, please feel free to get in touch with me or Sumitra directly. Um, we've li linked an online form um, and our website in the recorded presentation, but we can also try to drop it in the chat or um, in the Slack workspace later on. 
And thank you for joining us today to learn more about CARTA and our collaborative approach to archiving web-based art resources. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, Miranda, do you want to speak next? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. So I'm Miranda Seiler, um, and my presentation was Collaborative Collection Development Challenges and Opportunities. Um, and in my presentation, I talk about my recent foray into the role of web collection librarian at the Art, uh, sorry, at the Ivy Plus Libraries Confederation. Um, I only just started on March 1st, so it's still pretty new. Um, the Ivy Plus Libraries Confederation is a consortium of 13 academic institutions from across the United States, Brown University, University of Chicago, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Duke, Harvard, John Hopkins, MIT, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, Stanford, and Yale. Um, and what started out as a pilot program with two collections in 2013 is now a full-fledged initiative with about 30 active collections and counting. Seeds are chosen by librarians from across the 13 institutions and occasionally beyond, while I manage the day-to-day -day web crawling activities. Most of our selector librarians have little understanding of the IPLC collections that they are not directly involved in, however, um, which has led to data budget concerns and metadata inconsistencies. So, you know, our content is extremely diverse and that's great, um, but it can also feel fractured or disjointed when viewed as a whole. So in my talk, I outlined three goals for myself um, in order to bring our different collections and their selector librarians more in conversation with each other. So. Um, one, increase communication, two, increase standardization, and three, increase engagement. And I outline um, a few ideas uh, that I have for accomplishing these goals from creating a newsletter to reevaluating our metadata um, to bringing in new selectors. Um, and I also would welcome any ideas that you might have um, during this uh, session. If you want to put it in the chat, I might not read as we go along, but I'll certainly read them all later. Um, and finally, um, before I and I just want to mention a couple of the people who stewarded these collections before I was brought on board. So um, Anna Parici, who ran the pilot, my predecessor, Samantha Abrams, the former bibliographic assistant, Jean Park, as well as Alex Thurman, um, who's on this panel and who managed the collections during my position's year-long vacancy, and our current bibliographic assistant, um, Emily Uruchima. And that's all I have, so thanks. All right, thanks, Miranda. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the IPC Collaborative Collections, and all of you know are familiar with the IPC because you're attending our, our conference. Um, but for those who don't know about the background of the Collaborative Collections uh, initiative itself, um, the IPC has a history of, of building collections together, going back to the Olympics collection of 2010, and then another collection in 2012. These were run by the Access Working Group which no longer exists, um, but um, those collections were hosted by, all the crawling was done by the Internet Archive and um, the collections were not public. And so there was some desire at the time in about 2014 to um, make a more, uh, a more uh, rigorous uh, and robust infrastructure for collecting collaboratively at, with IPC. And so uh, a proposal was, was passed around in the, at the conference in Paris, uh, proposing that we hire a, a web archiving service and, and that we jointly build collections that would be publicly accessible right from the start. And um, after some review uh, of the various vendors that were available, we chose Archivit, and we've been building Archivit collections ever since. Um, in, in, the, in the presentation, you see uh, a list of them. Uh, I, I won't mention them all now, but we continue to, to do Olympics collections. We have a large collection on the novel coronavirus. Uh, we did a, one of our first big collections was on World War I commemoration, the, the centennial anniversary of World War I. Uh, and we have a, an ongoing, ongoing collections about the National Olympics and Paralympics committees and uh, intergovernmental organizations. So over in the latter case, over 400 intergovernmental organizations, none of which are, um, easily collected by the individual member libraries of IPC because many of them have national mandates and these are in, in, in intrinsically intergovernmental, you know, international entities. 
So it's a great fit for the for the IPC to be the one to to capture these these websites, and that collection is uh, a long term collection designed to revisit the same sites over time and give a kind of longitudinal view, whereas some of our collections are more um, event based and, and and limited in time. Um, we've had particip we've had participation in one or more of these collections from at least thirty three different member libraries. Uh, and we've had lead curators come from at least six or seven different libraries, uh, which are all outlined in our presentation. And we thank those people, and we want to encourage more uh, more people to step forward to lead lead collections for us. Um, in the proposal in the presentation, I went over some of the um, metadata practices. Basically, they, they they vary by collection, but we do have uh, a lot of C level metadata provided by our curators, along with the nominations for all of our collections. And uh, I'll end the summary by uh, jumping to the end where we talked about some of the benefits and the challenges of, of our collaborative collections initiative. The benefits are that we are, have been able to create unique thematic web archive collections that are all openly accessible on the web. They're multinational, multilingual. Um, they're, they're informed by curators with expertise on their nation's context and perspectives. And because they're archived collections, they're all indexed for full text search, which is nice. And participating in these collections has been a good best practice exchange for all of us involved. Uh, and, and, and even I, as a, as a, as a full-time user of Archivit, I've learned a lot more about Archivit functionality because of the challenges in, involved with some of our big collections like the COVID collection. Um, so it's been beneficial for our own private um, jobs as well. Uh, Lastly, we, we, we view it as a benefit that these, these collections that we've created may be a useful outreach mechanism for spreading awareness of the IPC and of internet preservation generally. Um, but some of the challenges that we face are, the main one is that we have no dedicated project staff. The IPC members um, collaboratively fund our archivist subscription, which is for which we are grateful, um, but there's no um, dedicated staff funding. So all of the work that is done curating these collections, doing the web archiving, uh, doing the selection of the sites, doing the quality control, et cetera, providing the metadata, all that is volunteer um, work provided by our, our members. So that's part of what I'm interested in talking about later in the session is comparing the four very different um, models of our, of, of, our, of our respective projects and talking specifically about how, how that relates to the funding. Um, one last point that I'll make about the challenges is that because what we're trying to do is build collaboratively, we tend to measure success quantitatively in terms of how many members participated or how many seeds were nominated or how much data we archived. And that's all, that's all well and good, but the, part of the, the downside of that is that if, if we're measuring success quantitatively, um, the bigger the collection gets, the, the, the less time our volunteer curators have for quality control, um, for shaping collections, curating them in a way that might make them for the best researcher data sets. So that's a challenge that I look forward to uh, discussing. So I'll stop there, I think, and let, uh, let us start thinking about questions. Panelists to um, turn on their video and, and audio again, and, and we can start some, some general discussion. So before we get into the QA from the participant, I mean, from the audience, let me start with some few general opening questions. Um, I think the first thing I'll ask for is just, is just where I left off. So we all have very interesting projects, different models, of, slightly different models of funding and staffing. And I would wonder if each of you could speak a little bit about, you know, exactly where that balance falls and where, where you, You've all said where your funding comes from. Like, what exactly is that money spent on, and and, and what aspects of your work do you depend on volunteers for? Anyone, anyone like to start? Um, I could start. Um, we can say quite um, plainly where our project funding is going in terms of staff. So it really goes in our, our project staff. So our three web archivists. Um, our rights officer, who's based at the National Library of Scotland, 
the software search engineer again at National Library of Scotland, and a metadata officer um, who's at NLS as well. And um, I think that's everyone. I'm sure I haven't left anyone out, left me on team. Um, and apart from that, we have um, a whole structure around the, the project to, to run the project. So the organisation of um, the project relies on not so much volu voluntary um, help, but rather um, we have uh, staff from each of the, the libraries involved, including myself, who have a, a day job. And um, essentially our libraries are volunteering our time. So I'm part time in this project. And that is the case with all the line management for the web archivists. So they're based at each of um, these university libraries and so they're being managed there as well and there's an advisory board who sit across um the steering group so we have a steering group who kind of meet every month and kind of run the project but there's also an advisory board who meet less frequently they've met once and they'll meet two more times during the course of this slightly more than a year-long project and um that involves you know in again kind of voluntary um involvement from um internet archive the bbc and um, there are a number of organizations i should remember them um, but the digital preservation coalition uh national archives national records of scotland our sister institution in um edinburgh and the alan turing institute as well so i think i've remembered everybody but yes so i think um as far as volunteering goes, um, we, I mean, we're about four months in, and I don't know if this is something we might reconsider even as we're working through the project, but um, so far we're not getting an awful lot of um, kind of involvement into the kind of the curatorial side, I don't know. The odd team, I don't know if um, you're thinking about outreach and you're perhaps sitting there thinking I'm wrong, maybe you could come in with us. The, yeah, the only thing that I can think of uh, on top of this is that and again it's not really volunteering because it's more like people like people getting associated time to participate in the project but um, because we're all based at like certain libraries or other institutions um, there's a lot of like people who know who have a lot of expertise on medical like history or research and that type of stuff so we've been contacting them and asking for their expertise and input into the project um but yeah again not not volunteering in the more traditional sense of uh, of of getting people um from outside to, to participate if that makes sense um so yeah <laughs> thank you so i think so for the term volunteer i, I think i just uh, another way of saying it would be in kind donations so basically uh People continuing to do their their the same kind of work they do for their own institution, except doing it on this this new um, project. So, did I understand correctly that that those three web archivists are dedicated are exclusively to this project, or are they are they people who are, who are full time doing work for these organizations anyway, and are now also doing this work? So, sorry, Ailey, I will quickly drum. Um, so we were all hired specifically for the project. So the free art web archivists and we're all part-time and we work uh, full-time on this project. However, because we're based in like our own institutions, they have certain, um, what's like the time consuming activities that we also have to participate in. Uh, but technically we're full-time on this project, yes. Madeline and Sumitra, did you wanna? address this question regarding Carta? Sure, I can start this off. Um, I work full time on Carta at the Internet Archive um, since the initial launch in August. Um, I've been working full time on the community collaboration and communications, and I also handle all of the web crawling and collection work within our archived account. Um, our program team also includes Sumitra Duncan, who's here with me today, and um, Lori Donovan, who is the manager of the community programs team at the Internet Archive. Um, and so we lead the project, but I'm the only person who's working on it full time. Um, 
And we also have our 34 um, participating organizations, all with very level of varied levels of contributions to the project. Um, we expect that all of our members contribute regular website nominations through an online form and attend bi-monthly meetings to really have collaborative discussions that will enrich and, and lead the, um, the project forward. Um, but we also have four very active subcommittees for our members who would like to volunteer more time and um, efforts to the collections. Um, and those include our collection development subcommittee, our metadata subcommittee, and user engagement and outreach. Um, and so they, they um, in particular meet on a quarterly basis to have working sessions and have collaborative activities, um, giving more time and energy to the project and moving it forward. Thank you, Madeline. I think that was well said. Um, I can also add that we noted in our presentation that we have um, support via two present grants uh, that were awarded to the Internet Archive and NIARC in support of um, really catalyzing and, and growing this effort. And they, that funding comes from the NEH and the IMLS here in the United States. Um, but those are two year grants. And so it is our intention after that initial grant period that we will have established a sustainability plan um, with input from our member organizations and potentially seek additional funding, but we'll be looking at a model in order to continue the work that we have established, continue to grow the collections and bring on more members um, in a shared capacity. Okay. Miranda? Yeah, so um, the funding for this program comes from the 13 institutions that pull resources together. Um, in order to fund this. So, and that funding goes towards my salary, um, the salary of the bibliographic assistant who is part-time, um, the archivate subscription, um, as well as um, preservation um, costs. Um, we're in the middle of doing uh, locks implementation. So, um, so that's all where the funding comes from. I'm the only person who works full-time on the project. Um, and then the all of the selector librarians, the people who actually, um, you know, uh, curate the collections and pick the seeds and everything, um, that is all, um, I guess we call it volunteer time. And I think that that's, um, you know, going back to Alex's point, like one of the issues um, that or one of the challenges of this program is that, um, you know, while we have some selector librarians who really um, all they need to participate is the, you know, just the fact that it's a good thing to do and that it's, you know, in line with their other job responsibilities. Um, you know, that's enough for them to be enthusiastic and engaged. But then there are some people who um, I would guess see it as sort of um, an extra task um, as opposed to being um, folded in with uh, their other collection development work. So um, yeah, I think that it's something that uh, you need to think about as far as sort of reframing that and um, you know where, where this lies within uh, your job role, um, you know, uh, beyond um, just like an extra thing or an extra task that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say just about the IPC project. I mean, since I raised it, I, I, you heard me say earlier we we have only only our archivate funding comes comes from IPC, and the rest is is time contributed by members. Um, in part because they they view the collections that we're creating as being in line with their missions. That it's not entirely voluntary in that sense. It, it, we do feel like these collections are in part and parcel the same kinds of things that we're doing at our own institutions, and so they're worth worth doing. Um, but we are exploring, Nicola and I are exploring options for, uh, you know, how we could um, move forward as a, as, as a, as a, as an initiative. And one of the ways might be to um, have a contract-based employment of, of per particular collection um, so that it's not all falling on, on, on the, the co-chairs and, and the, the most active volunteer curators. Uh, and so, um, I guess I'm interested in, in any thoughts. I mean, one of the things that uh, Sumitra brought up was the 
question of sustainability. Uh, and, and, and I'm curious about whether all of these different projects have different timelines or whether, whether are any of them designed to end at a particular date, known date in advance, or are they intended to be uh, ongoing? Um, so the, for, I'll start with the IPC thing. We, we, we are um, renewed basically from year to year. We have a, a permanent committee, but we, we don't know for sure that the, the you know, archivist budget is going to be renewed every year. It depends on the overall IPC budget and things like that. So we, we assume that we're going to continue doing this, but we depend on, on annual uh, approval of our budget and we depend on, um, you know, the presence of people willing to do this work. So how about the rest of you? What are you, what are your, um, what's this, the long-term sustainability aspect of your, of your projects respectively? Samantha, did you want to start with that since you, you, you raised it before? What exactly are you guys thinking about what that will look like after the grant runs out? Sure. Um, and I, I would point out that we don't have, you know, an end goal in mind in terms of how much um, content is collected or how large these collections may grow. Um, our intention is for them to scale over time based on um, input from our collection development subcommittee and our members who are participating in the program. Um, and so once the grant funding is uh, complete, which will be later in 2023, um, we will have worked with the membership to determine um, you know, if we keep things at the same scale that they are at that point, or if we want to continue to scale that beyond our current scope and membership, um, it's our hope that we'll have members joining um, from a larger geographic range um, and in order to expand the scope of the collections as well in terms of art and art history resources on the web. Um, so that model could look like um, additional grant funding if we're able to seek that out or um, organizations that are specifically interested in supporting um, preservation of art resources and contemporary art practice. Um, but we also have considered looking at a model in which the membership would share some of the cost in terms of, um, you know, membership fee, what have you, that could contribute to the cost of data and staffing in terms of the technical work that we'll be doing. Um, and we do have a number of um, responsibilities within the membership that do fall into that volunteer category where, where members are contributing just a very small portion of their time in order to um, do collection development, to contribute to metadata, as well as our outreach um, work that we do in order to get the word out and, and um, hopefully bring in additional members to, to the collaborative. So it is still taking shape. Um, we don't know exactly, but we're, we're optimistic um, just based on the progress that we've made so far that we will be able to come up with a model that is actually sustainable. Okay. Uh, Ailey and, and Leontine, do you want to speak to the what do you think of the duration of your project? Yes, no, I've been really interested in this aspect of the Carta project. It's just um, very, it's uh, something that I, it's sort of on my mind quite often with uh, web archive collections, but I think um, in this particular project, we have a, a final report in which we are going to be making recommendations. And I think that um, we'll certainly be looking at the sustainability of a collection, which essentially it's trying to characterize, you know, this um, and well, the characterize where medical publishing is online, the official, the unofficial, and just what the face of it is without, you know, fear or favor. And I think um, and I'm biased that that's very important and that it should continue. Um, so I think, although I haven't um, honestly really thought about it in as much detail as, as you all have, um, I really think that is a very important thing to include in the work of this project to try and secure the future of uh, a thematic collection for um, medical information, warts and all. I don't know, Leontine, did you have a thought? Yeah, I completely agree with you, but like, could be quite biased there as well. Um, the one thing that I do like about this project around like sustainability, and I also saw a question in the Q&A around like long-term preservation, is that we are really lucky to have like the British Library as our partner, because it's not as if we're making um, our own separate collection. We're all, we're, um, 
putting targets into an existing like infrastructure. So it's the UK web archive where we're um, like collecting on. Is that the right? There's this, our somatic collection will be part of the UK web archive. Um, and therefore that sustainability of that somatic collections is uh, more, is, is like more sustained than if it were to be um, our, ourselves collecting it and preserving it, if that makes sense. Um, mm. So that's good. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think it would be useful to, to think about more of like the future of this project and how, how it could continue on. Because um, we do have a very set date at the moment when it stops, which is um, April 2023, isn't it, Aidy? I think so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so it would be, I mean, it, I should put a couple of words in. Firstly, I forgot to mention the UK Web Archive when I was speaking about <laughs> um, partners who are having to find time um, to volunteer for that, uh, to support this project within their normal. So they've made this, added this as an extra commitment and we are very grateful. Um, this website this so this public health discourse collection um whatever it will end up being called um will sit alongside a number of other um medical collections medical um web archive collections going all the way back to the collection made by the welcome institute who provide the funding for this project so there is um arguably a kind of a lineage of this type of um collection which goes all the way back to 2004 in the uk web archive and so i think that's um partly an argument for you know for the need to sustain it but yes i think that's going to be very important as we come towards the end of the project right. miranda i know you just started at your new job but do you what do you what do you understand to be the, the situation with um mm -hmm. iv plus's long-term status so the program as i understand it is renewed every few years um to give an example like my contract is for three years um with the strong likelihood that it'll be renewed. It doesn't seem that um, folks are going to want to get rid of it. Um, the people who are in charge of that decision. Um, so to give some context, the Ivy Plus Libraries Confederation is a partnership that um, of which the web art uh, collecting program is only a small part of. So um, they also do other stuff. Um, and uh, one of those things is collective um, uh, collection development, basically. So we fall under this uh, larger collection development group, and um, they uh, have some say as you know whether our specific part of that um, program uh, continues. But like I said, I, I I think it's unlikely that it will go away anytime soon. It's already been around for almost ten years now. So um, if you think about the pilot uh, in two thousand thirteen, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you all. All right. So th thanks for all that conversation. I want to do shift now to the, make sure we get to some of the audience's questions. Um, I think, let's see, I'm, let's see where I'm getting it from. Olga, should I, I go for the questions that you sent me in chat or should I go through the Q&A section? Let's see. All right. Q&A. So I think this was alluded to um, by, by one of the panelists already, which is the first question we have is from Suzanne Van de Eichel, and it's a question about the long-term preservation of the web collections during your projects as well. Um, what did we, you know, what, what steps have, have the various projects taken on this? Do you store the collections in a preservation system, for example, or do you guarantee the long-term accessibility some other way? And is one institution responsible for this or do you share this task? So we will tackle that question. I can answer first on the behalf of the IPC is that we uh, we are an Archivit subscriber. So our, currently the long-term preservation is being done by Archivit. Um, we haven't, we don't have any formal other plans for the long-term preservation of the data. However, we are experimenting with um, uh, an access portal uh, hosted by the Biblioteca Alexandrina. But I think the, the function there is mostly for for uh, you know, indexing the, the the content for searching uh, and, and analysis, not so much for long-term preservation. 
but what is uh, what's the situation with the rest of you on long-term preservation? Brenda, do you want to start? I know you just recently yeah. worked on this. <laughs> I, yeah, I can say really quickly. So um, we are also Archivit uh, subscribers. So that's um, where all of our data is being stored right now. Although um, we are in the process of also doing a locks implementation. Um, it has been slow going um, and the plan is to have locks boxes at um, I believe six of our um, institutions in addition to um, one at the Internet Archive. So um, it's happening, but um, it, it, it slowly um, the idea is to have, you know, copies of all of our stuff um, located at the various institutions um, as well. So, yeah. Leontine, you were saying that the, the, the UK Web Archive is the long-term preservation place for that? Is that what... Yeah, yeah. Um, I've not been in this role very long, so I don't know the exact long-term preservation uh, setup that the UK Web Archive has, so Ailey could maybe add a little yes. bit on that. Um, yes, no, happy to add. I think it's... Um, so the UK Web Archive is... Um, the provides a preservation store which is um located now let me try and get this right it's located in outside yorkshire boston spa um, and there are nodes of which this um is replicated we're actually in the process of um re-replicating um the uk web archive for um uh, the National Library of Scotland as well. So we're looking at um, kind of work on preservation um, storage so that we're um, in a number of different places, um, geographically separate locations across the UK. The purpose of um, the, so it's stored in, and I wish, um, again, I wish I had, was able to call on Andy Jackson to give you a better explanation of this, but the the, um, the legal deposit library system is the store for um, copyright uh, materials, non-print legal deposit in the UK, and the intention is to keep that pretty much forever. So that would be where we are keeping our um, web archive material, mm -hmm. and that's where our collections will be stored as well. Madeline, I know the Internet Archive's long-term preservation is quite robust, but did you want to describe that briefly? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the one institution that's in charge of the technical aspects of CARTA and the long-term pres preservation is the Internet Archive. Um, we're currently building, maintaining, um, preserving, and providing, providing access to CARTA collections through archive it um, and its web application. Um, but later this year, we will also be building a public access portal with um, Internet Archive technical staff um, to increase access and um, search and discovery in the collections. Um, and Sumitra, did you have anything else to add on, on there? Yeah, yeah that was <laughs> great. Great. Uh I'll move to the next question. Thank you all for that. The next question is from Katrine Waynes, and it's directed at uh, Ailey. And it says the, focus, the project is currently focused on selection and crawling, but how will the collection be maintained on a long term? Who will update the collection? So not so much the long term preservation per se, but the the um, continuing curation uh, of the content of the, of, of the you know adding new stuff or adding new crawls. Yeah, so here I have to be a little bit speculative. My hope is um, that the I think um, it's becoming quite clear to universities, um, generally as institutions, that they need a web archivist. And um, at the moment, um, Cambridge University Libraries and Bodleian University Libraries already have web archivists, or they have that function is kind of um, worked into what they're doing as um, members of the UK Web Archive. Another partner, um, unfortunately, won't be able to attend today. Um, Alice Austin is working at Edinburgh University Library, and I'm kind of hoping that they will see the value of the, this work just through the, the project. I'm hoping that they'll um what's the word they'll they'll see the light and understand that this is um <laughs> at least a, a necessary part of um archiving what's currently being published but um so my point being um 
I think that this is a collection which will certainly still keep open. Um, I don't think it will be as actively selected for just in the nature of things. Um, and I mean, I have I have quite a quiet little hope that um, some of the sustainability for the, the collection will simply be that it is um, such a broad thematic collection that it's it's just um, it has a particular value to maintain it. And so I think I can see my library um, seeing um, real value in continuing to select for it. And I'm hoping that our partner libraries will also um, consider continuing that activity. But we'll see. I don't know yet. Yeah, speaking to that, I see Nicholas says in, in the chat that uh, UK Web, Web Archive staff will be helping with that in the future. That's good to know. Um, Next question is from Megan Lyon. It's for Madeline and Sumitra. And it's um, about metadata. So were any controlled vocabularies used by the CARTA Collection Development Subcommittee for the definitions of the collection topics? And what other assessment parameters were used across the topics for site nominations other than a site being at risk of disappearing? So um, what, question one, any controlled vocabulary is used? And, and, and part two is uh, what, other assessment parameters besides sites being at risk? I can take the controlled vocabulary part of that, I feel like, Madeline. Um, we didn't utilize them in terms of the collection descriptions initially, but um, we additionally have a metadata subcommittee that meets. There's some overlap with uh, participants from the collection development subcommittee. Um, so we did have a conversation about controlled vocabularies that we would utilize in our metadata in describing the resources. Um, so we determined that we would utilize Library of Congress subject headings, but additionally utilize the Getty's um, Art and Architecture Thesaurus AAT in order to describe these resources. And Madeline, feel free to, to add additional. Yeah, when we started um, collecting website nominations back in November, um, the website nomination form only included a few um, different lines for metadata fields, including title and contributor. Um, more recently, we've worked with the collection development and metadata teams to expand that. So now we're collecting a lot more metadata fields up front, um, mostly Dublin Core. Um, and so those will be included on the um, the public credit collections very soon um, after a little bit more work by that team to fill in all the gaps for um, past website nominations. Um, also on the website nomination form, we do have a few different, uh, we do have a field with a few different um, options available um, for prioritization of the website. Um, so nominators can select if a website is especially at risk and needs to be captured um, and prioritized sooner. Um, and we also collect just standard web, web arts websites that will um, be collected on a regular basis going forward rather than a one time at risk website. Madeline, do you have one form that you use for all the collections that has the collection as one of the questions or do you have separate forms for each collection? Yeah, exactly. It's one one public form um, with a drop down menu for selecting the collection topic. Right. And I also noticed that uh, since I'm involved with various collaborative collections as well, if, if you take the form approach, does that um, intentionally slow down the rate of nominations? I mean, do, do you find that your curators wish that they could go directly to the spreadsheet and paste in 100 at a time or, or, is, or how's that working out? It's it's working out pretty well so far. Um, we haven't received any any complaints, at least directly yet. Um, the form is integrated with a Google Sheet that is um, accessible to all CARTA members. Um, and so, if if members wanted to um, kind of um, copy and paste more bulk um, website nominations in the future, that could be an option. Um, but it's not a part of our workflow right now. Okay, great. Um, I want to see the next question. It would be for Miranda. This is also from Megan Lyon. It says, you ended your presentation with a question to the community about how to get workflow buy-in from your selecting librarians. Could you talk a bit more about what you'd like to accomplish in this sense? And do you, any of the other session speakers have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, this is 
it's hard to answer. Um, I think that, you know, even talking just about having the one form is something that I wish that we could have, but I think that our selector librarians, to Alex's point, might riot um, having to fill everything out one by one, because um, they tend to do them in like big batches, um, you know, when they do them at all. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it's difficult. I think that, you know, on one hand, it's a matter of getting people to contribute at all. Um, you know, in my presentation, I had that network graph that I did, um, but what that didn't, or that I that I created, but what that didn't like um, convey is that you know some of those dots aren't actually contributed. Like they're they're listed as selectors, but they might not actually be. You know, there there could be a a collection that has you know. 10 or 12 listed selectors, but in reality, only one person is actually contributing. Um, or we have a select, uh, a, you know, a, um, a collection that only has two selectors, but they're both very active and work well together. So, um, you know, it's hard. Each collection is very, very different. And I think that um, standardization is something that, uh, you know, is something that I would love to do in any way I can, but is also, and there are going to be limits, I think, to what I can do, um, especially when people are really stuck in their ways as, as far as, you know, their own um, workflows and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the big, the big question. Thank you. Hello, oh, and I have popped in to ask Alex a final question since he was moderating and uh, presenting this session. I had one final question for you about the IPC collections and with them being so, you know, the goal of them being transnational, like how do we go about increasing the geographic diversity with those collections? I know that IPC members tend to be clustered in certain regions. So what's your current thinking on that? Uh, well, as with all our work, it's very volunteer dependent. So some some of our selectors uh, seem to be feel constrained to only collect stuff for their own countries, but others partly because that's their that's their national mandate in their jobs. But uh, others, like for example, working for universities, don't necessarily think in terms of, of country specific only, and so and and they may in fact be be employed by the university because of their specialty in another region or something like that. So. Reaching out to more people, you know, who aren't necessarily the web archivists from our member institutions, but who are subject specialists, that could be one approach, and it's that's worked for us some in the past. We had a collection of online newspapers where we had people from Stanford, for example, who were experts in in sub-Saharan Africa, nominating seeds for that, and we could have more of that kind of thing. Um, but I also want to make uh, uh, a recommendation in the opposite direction, which is away from um, uh, predefined expertise, which is that this part of what's fun about this or what really is voluntary about this IPC initiative is that um, we can we can step outside our own uh, in, institutional roles a little bit and any of us could select websites even if that's not our role in our institutions uh, yes Abby Kraki could could pick 10 websites for me tomorrow so um, that's the kind of thing I want to I want to encourage so so people are who are among us who are most concerned about these gaps um, could could step forward and fill slightly fill one of those gaps, like you know, uh, look look into COVID sites from Southeast Asia or something like that, and that you know that would be really helpful. But I don't have a, a, a you know a more thought out strategy than that, unfortunately, because it's a big problem. That's great. Well, thank you all for this fabulous uh, Q and A session. This has been great.